The Athletic. Hello and welcome to From the Rookery End, uh, a podcast brought to you by The Athletic and we like to, to think of this as a, a sharing of our life following Watford FC. My name is John, uh, with me uh, here in England is Jason. Good afternoon. And somewhere in foreign climes is Michael. Hola senors, hola. Oh, so we're saying Spain then. Uh, where are you Mike? I'm looking out over the glistening Atlantic Ocean, the palm trees just gently blowing in the breeze. Uh, from the wonderful volcanic island of Lanzarote. Lovely. And you, you actually, when you said you were going to watch the game and then you could still do the podcast, it was like brilliant. It, it, it gave me a flashback to about 1994 uh, when I was away in Tunisia and that, that time where you could only ever find out what the scores were when the paper turned up a day or if not two days later. Um, and that wasn't a great time for Watford. I wasn't running to find out the Watford score necessarily. But, I was, but you were, was, though, weren't you? Well, I That's did. That's the whole thing. Yeah, I probably even, did. Even though it didn't matter. <laughs> even though it didn't matter, you still... Because I remember doing exactly the same thing. I was in Thailand, and I think I forked out well over the odds to find out how Watford had got on against Ipswich <laughs> in an absolute meaningless championship fixture when Watford weren't struggling. And it's just that thing, isn't it? it was, it's just built in us that we have to find out wherever we are, whatever it takes. I love that, I love that. It's certainly easier in the modern world, Mike, where you can sit and watch the game uh, and tweet us and, or message us throughout the entire game of uh, how it went. Because Watford have just lost away at Tottenham Hotspur, not maybe a, a result we weren't uh, expecting, um, but it was a, a, a very different performance from last week's loss away at Brighton. Jason, it was a, a really interesting team sheet. We don't often talk about that, that as a starter, but the midfield, let's start there maybe. I think that for me that was the biggest difference. But when you saw that 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 midfield of uh, Atebo still being the the anchor at the back, but with Sissoko making his debut only days after signing, and back from what must have been some very special hands in the Watford massage suite, back earlier than we expected, Yuvai Kuchka uh, as part of that midfield three. What was the difference that made for you compared to last week? As you say, probably an unexpected midfield, and that that probably gives the side a lift anyway. We we weren't expecting Kuchka to come back so quickly. I wasn't expecting Sissoko to start, having just signed late in the week, and and I don't think he's been involved at all, has he, with, with Spurs so far this season? So expecting him to to lack match fitness, it probably wasn't a surprise that he got subbed off um, halfway through the second half. His legs probably were starting to tire, but that in itself, just seeing those names on the lineup, probably gives the the team as a whole uh, a, a little boost before kick off. Maybe not Tom Cleverley, because <laughs> he, he was the one that was dropped. Yeah, yeah. So may, maybe not Tom, but it's a it's a squad game, Brian. You know, you have to uh, <laughs> do your do your thing for the team. And and we had a little spring in our step for the first ten minutes, didn't we? That spring in our step, Mike. It didn't continue, but it certainly. I don't know that performance overall. It wasn't. I mean, I, I, it feels like a hundred times, maybe only ten times, maybe only two times better than last week at at, at Brighton. There was. From the from the get go, to to use one of your phrases, Mike, there was really an intention there to play a certain way, wasn't there? I th- yeah, I think you're perhaps being a little bit harsh, suggesting that the spring and the step didn't didn't last on. I thought for the first forty five minutes, in particular, I thought the first half performance was was markedly better than the second. But I thought in the first half, we asked plenty of questions of of Tottenham, and we've already been quite effusive this season about how our our front and our attacking options looked and again they found themselves in decent positions today we were sat next to a, a, a Tottenham fan here at, at, in the bar watching the game <laughs> watching it in a bar shock horror I hear you say but um, God and that was proper Brent wasn't it watching in a bra, bar shock horror <laughs> but uh, he was uh, but we, me and Arlo both said if, you know, if they were Tottenham chances they would have scored so I, I thought the way Watford played and you mentioned Kuchka there him being back just gave us that just solidity in in midfield you know Sissoko was strong and uh, as you'd expect but I don't think he'd have the impact he had the impact that we hope he will have in two or three weeks time when he's up to to match fitness but I thought that that first half was was really really encouraging in particular and it was frustrating in that regard 
that Tottenham scored so late in the so late in the half because I think it was pretty much level pegging really wasn't it and that's the thing that I've been worried about with this Watford side making the step up how will we deal when we're playing against a, a genuine Premier League side with not just Premier League pedigree but European pedigree you know people like uh, Son who is a, an absolutely superb footballer Harry Kane coming back into the fold you know and all the euphoria that comes with that and Tottenham feel like a, a better Tottenham side this season than they did under Jose Mourinho, didn't they? So it's a very different proposition. So I was nervous about how Watford were going to play today, and I was pleasantly surprised. And I think you can tell that just by the way we're talking. You know, we're very upbeat. We've lost the game, but all of us are sort of quite upbeat in terms of in terms of the overall performance. Like I say, I think the first half was better than the second, but on another day we we score at least once, um, and and, it, and we're having a different conversation. So. I think the midfield was, was good. I think with a bit more composure up top, we would have asked more questions of the Tottenham defence and Hugo Lloris. But, but overall, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied, really. Those chances, I, I feel like I want to invent a new term. Three-quarter chances. Because they weren't quite, <laughs> quite clear-cut, were they? Yeah, but they were yeah, better than half chances. They, yeah. they, they felt that they were opportunities. Like you say, Mike, uh, if Tottenham get them, you think they do better with them and they score. We've so often... What for teams of the past we've talked about? Oh, we're just lacking that final ball. The final ball was was better today, but we just didn't quite make the most of those three quarter chances that came our way. Do you think, Jason, that is the fact that we have, you know, that that starting that, that, that front three? Let's say none of them have started together in the same way at all in the this is our fourth game of the season they've all played of course but do you think that was a big difference the fact that we maybe might have found another 10 percent somewhere if if we had a solid in sync starting three up front not entirely sure i think if we were if if we were back to the old excuse of not having the final balls or not putting the ball in the areas where the uh the other attacking players are expecting to see it then i'd say yes maybe that's the case so Perhaps it's it is a positive that we were able to create chances like that um, when we've got a front three that hadn't played together as as much um, or at all um, so far this season. Uh, I thought we talked about after the Villa game that Dennis and Saar linked up really well. I didn't get the same impression from King and either Dennis or Saar across the, the front three, and it and it didn't change much when we sort of changed it up front either. Yet we did still, as a counter-attacking side, we, we were able to create sort of those those decent chances. So it, it bodes well for the future that we've mixed it up a bit today. We've still created things at the team that are now top of the league. OK, it's early days, but like we've said, they're, they're European pedigree side. So I think plenty to be positive about there. The, the danger is, of course, we don't want to be in a, in a position where we're losing 1-0, playing well and losing 1-0 every week, because before we know it, we're in a... We're in trouble. We're, we're cut adrift. Obviously, that's a, that's a long way off at the moment. So we just got to make sure that we turn those positives into point-winning performances. I really like the shape of Josh King. He looks to me like a, a striker. He looks to me like a man who can play through the middle. Is happy to play through the middle. Happy to use his uh, his strength and his his form to to try and get one over on. The, he looks like a number nine to me. What I want to see a bit more from Dennis is. A bit more um, just confidence in himself because I think there was one of those three quarter chances that Jason so rightly and articulately described them as. He had a chance to, to, to pull the trigger basically and he didn't. I think he had it on his right foot. He could have shot and he wanted, he wanted another, another chance. If that was Son, if that was Kane, they would have just had a, had a chance. They would have taken the chance and possibly would have scored. So I just think if he can be a little bit more confident in his own abilities a bit more clinical then I think we could have a real real exciting um, real exciting time of it up there and I just there's there's plenty there there's plenty there I think Ismail Assar looked really really dangerous early on and yes he didn't have that same link up with, with Dennis we didn't have that same sort of electricity was there between them um, but what he did do was cause trouble down the, the right very early on and I think what we need to do is make sure that we back that up with being strong defensively so that they don't feel perhaps that maybe they feel like the pressure's on them to take those chances because we know that at the other end of the pitch we're slightly more um, susceptible. I don't, I, I don't know if that plays on a striker's mind, but I agree with what you say, Jay. Watching it, you think, oh, God, this reminds us of when we've been up before under, under Boothroyd and under Graham Taylor when we, 
mo for the most part, we were in games for large portions of it and came away thinking, you know, we did all right there. If we do that again next week, we'll be OK. But it happens again and again. I don't get that feeling from this Watford side. I do get the feeling that they're capable of, of carving something out. I do think there's a little bit of more steel and determination and, and talent there, quite frankly. All of a sudden, it looks like a pretty, a pretty strong squad and it didn't go our way today. But I don't think anyone could have complained if we'd, if we'd have come away with a one or draw, Spurs fans included. Let, let's talk about why we weren't uh, going away with, with a point. Um, it was a free kick, um, which many angles of this can be seen as why it was uh, should have been a free kick and a badly defended free kick. Mike, firstly, free kick wise, unbelievable in many reasons why it was given it was a very very light almost like the fix was in but no very very light uh, free kick what I don't understand with these free kicks and, and and to be fair there was one given against Tottenham in the second half as well the player pushes the ball past Cathcart and then run, tries to run through him now what's a six foot two hulking great defender supposed to do disappear into thin air just so the guy can get, get past him It's the, the Tottenham player just ran into him and I, 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 I guess it's obstruction. I guess that's what the free kick is yeah, given for. It just, it just isn't. It, Cathcart's got nowhere to go. He's got absolutely no... There's no reason for him just to sort of stand aside and let him go just because the guy's put the ball around him. So, for me, it's an incredibly soft free kick. And, you know, that's, that's me speaking emotively as a, as a Watford fan. Jason, who's played the game much more than, than I have, may have a different view, and I'd, I'd like to hear that. But for me... I don't know, I just find it frustrating when they automatically get given as free kicks. Chase? With, with these sort of 50-50 decisions, I always think, what if, what if it was the other way round? Would I be annoyed if we didn't get the free kick? Or would I think we've got away with one if we did? And I... I, 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 to be fair to the ref, I think it was a, it was a foul. I think if he'd sort of launched the ball, sort of smashed it past him and, and uh, drew the foul that way, <clears throat> and you think, well, he's not going to get the ball anyway... Why? Yeah, you can't give that. But I think, I think if he's where can he go? If, Literally, I'd I'd like to, I'd like to see it again. I, I mean, we we had one of the best best players at winning fouls that way in Hyder Helgson. Mm. Used to used to wait for the the man to come in. And then play the ball past and and literally sort of run into the man and win the free kick and we never never seem to have any issues with that. I think if it's if it's the other way round, we'd be expecting a free kick, and I, I know it can be tricky. But having said all of that, whether we think it should have been given or not, we should still be stopping that from going in the back of the net. Yeah, it wasn't the uh, the greatest defending or greatest goalkeeping for that that goal, Mike um, Bartman. Didn't come anywhere near it. I, I wouldn't expect it's Son to have a go at goal at that point. It was, it, you know, from that that side of the of the goal, you you expect him to be, be swung in. He just didn't quite react in time. How how much blame are you putting on on uh, Mr. Barkman? Sat next to Arlo during the game, and he puts all of all the blame of it, yeah, on I bet, I bet. Batman. He was he was pretty livid. Anyone watching the, the game here with us um, was in no doubt as to where, where how who Arlo thought was to to blame. It was a, I thought it was a decent ball in. I think perhaps, I don't know if you ask questions to the centre-backs who let their, top, their, their Tottenham counterparts get ahead of them and, and the fact that top, the, the Tottenham strikers were ahead of the Watford defenders meant that Backman was expecting uh, a Tottenham toe to get on the end of that, that good delivery. So I understand it, but if you're a top-level goalkeeper, I think you just have to follow the ball. You know, if the Tottenham player gets there ahead of the defender, then it's the defender's fault. As it was, it has to go down as a Backman error. I, I get it, I understand it. But I still think it was a, it was an error by him, and it's and it's frustrating because it turned out to be the the only goal of the game, and so close to half time as well. So it just felt like it all combined to be really quite irritating, quite frankly. Yeah, I think it has to go down as a backman error. You know, we're playing in the Premier League; it's the elite division in in Europe potentially. Follow the ball. You deal with the ball as the goalkeeper. If the striker gets there ahead of the defender, then you worry about that. But yeah, you, it's. it's it's a tough one to watch as a Watford fan to see that go in, wasn't it? Jay, second half wise, you've, we've touched it a bit already, but the whole thing about it, just, it wasn't, we weren't pushing for a goal. It didn't seem like we were at a great spell, but it was a positive second half. We didn't fall back. We didn't sulk, let's say. But second half wise, what did you feel about that performance? Yeah, again, I thought we, we started decently. I thought we, we, we came out 
with a bit of intent again in a similar way to we'd started uh, the first half whilst the quality perhaps wasn't there and we saw those sort of chances from the edge of the box for the midfielders we saw a little bit more from Sissoko uh, I thought first half he was we saw a nice sort of tidy player second half we saw one with a playing with a bit more intent to drive on with the ball and sort of he uh, was involved, I think, in one of the sort of dangerous, dangerous chances. Um, my my biggest worry, obviously, one nil down, we'd have to try and chase the game more and more. We had Itobo and Sissoko both on yellow cards. My fear was we were either going to be in a position where the game's opened up, they've got players running through the midfield and those two guys are chasing back, unable to make a challenge or even worse, find themselves with a, with a red card against their name. Um, and it didn't quite pan out like that and and then also last 10 minutes where you but we perhaps expected to to throw more at it again that didn't quite come off either. we seem to be willing but the, the the sort of the quality of it let us down a bit at the end there there was a, a, a dramatic air shot overhead kick attempt from Cucho which would have oh, looked yes. brilliant had it gone in if but, he's not going to um, score quickly he wants to score he wants to score dramatically I think there Cucho yeah that didn't happen and, and he probably wasn't involved in the game as much as he would have liked to have been for a team sort of chasing an equaliser because the substitutions wise it was interesting you know compared to last week at Brighton where we were two down you know he put a lot of strikers onto that pitch to give maybe an opportunity of scoring a goal you know, they, 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 all the subs today were like for like, Jason. They, you know, it didn't seem like there was an intention from Cisco to try and do something to get that goal back. Nothing, nothing dramatic, at least. I'd, yeah, and I think his hand was forced somewhat. Previously, we, we've sort of maybe questioned Cisco's substitutions, whether he does them early enough. But I think today, obviously, the Kafkar injury meant he had to bring... In Gakir on, it was probably too early at that stage to to really go for it. The, the Sissoko one was sensible, a player that's not played any football. First, or, yeah, making his debut for for the Hornets, first game of the season, on a yellow card. You're running the risk if you leave him on the pitch. So, could you have brought on a more attacking player at that stage? Bringing on cleverly, I guess, gives you someone. Again, we we know what cleverly is about. He's got that energy. He's got that drive. It's it's. Has he got the quality to unlock? Are we expecting Spurs to be sitting deep at that stage? Don't know. But so yeah, again, I think a, a, a like for like was was sensible there. Especially Jay's bearing in mind what happened at Brighton last week, where without a, an effective midfield, we we basically collapsed. I thought and, and conceded the game to Brighton basically because we didn't have that strong midfield trio enough. So I think maybe. He's learnt or has been burned by by what happened at the Amex last week. Yeah, absolutely. And then obviously the the, the last one was, or, or in fact, I can't remember the order. They and Gaki did get his chance at uh, at right back uh, in the Premier League. Uh, you know, taking off uh, Cathcart very early on in the second half. Cleverly was the last one, wasn't he? Cleverly was the last. One. Yeah. So yeah. in between those, in between those was was King going off um, again, a player that hasn't had as many minutes as, as some of the others. So. <sighs> Yeah, again, is that a sensible substitution from the point of view? You a player's not quite match fit. He will feature more and more in the weeks to come. You would expect um, bringing on Cucho, giving him another chance after his introduction, his spectacular introduction at home to Villa, seemed to be the the right thing to do. Moving Dennis to the middle this time, but obviously Cucho's goal came from a run down the left hand side. So again, he's looking sort of to make the same impact, which, as I mentioned before, didn't quite happen. Ismail Assar seems to have really, really impressive starts to games, and I don't know. And then in the, in the second half, whoever we're playing seems to deal with him slightly better. That might be just uh, recentism, and just it, it's happened today. And, and Brighton got got a hold of him quite successfully. I wonder if there's just a case for for switching up in that in that department because I think he had the the best of the exchanges down the right hand side early, but we didn't really see him in the in the second half at all. And I wonder whether. It might sound a bit daft taking what is effectively our best player off because you know it only takes one one decent run from him and, and, and a decent ball in. But I wonder whether it might be worth looking at him, maybe changing it up with him a little bit. I don't know what you guys think of that and whether that's the Sam Miguel talking from my end. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, you you know, we, when we went one behind, he was having much more opportunities before their first goal, and almost once their goal had gone in, they went all right. Then he's there. 
real, real danger. Let's just shut him down. So let's let's not you know think you know that that their left back. Let's not push him maybe as far. Let's make sure he is being dealt with. And like you say, he is getting a lot out of the beginning of a game where he's playing against a bunch of new teams who don't know exactly what he's going to be like in this division. And you hope that you know that's the big thing that he needs to learn. You know he needs to learn how to to mix himself up, switch sides maybe. Not necessarily take him off, but just give him the opportunity to be more than just that fast one down the wing, which of course is his his his, his strength. He just needs something else to to his game, Jace. I think yeah, so I think he, and I think he did drift a little bit, didn't he? he? Sort of drifted more central towards the end of the game and had a and sort of picked the ball up and had a decent run through the middle late on. I also wonder if obviously the way we're playing, we're working very hard, we're defending. So sort of our own half, we're, we're conceding possession a lot and you need to work hard as a team to do that. So I think the team generally, for me, when I've seen them, they, they've tired towards the end of game so far. So that will have an impact on Saar. He, he'll be doing a lot of chasing back. So fitness is a key thing there. So I think, yeah, he, he, he probably is tiring a bit. But then also he needs the support as well. I think it was a, the Villa game where we talked about what a good job Cleverly did of supporting him. And again, I wonder if that's where the Cleverly substitution came from. But midfield work hard. They'll tire as well. Perhaps the support's not as good. The balls into him won't be as good because that will go as other players start to tire. So I think that comes into it as well. As the 90 minutes progress, it's much harder to keep up that sort of standard and quality of football when you're working so hard on the pitch. Overall, I feel pretty positive about, about that performance. I think we've got... On the evidence of that, I think we've got enough to trouble the majority of sides in, in the Premier League. I think we're a long way off, you know, the, the real elite sides, you know, Manchester City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Manchester United. I think we rightly still need to hold them in high regard and perhaps worry about how we perform against them. Tottenham are, are a next step back. They're better than they were last season, I think. But I think we performed well against a res- resurgent Tottenham and I think... We, as Watford supporters, should take more positives than negatives from that game. I do wonder about the about the makeup of our defence over the year. You know, Firminia not not chosen in the squad today, so they're obviously not th- thinking he's ready to to make an appearance. I have to say that I I really worry about Messina. I think he switches off. I think he gets beaten far too easily. I think he finds himself out of shape a lot too often, far more frequently than than he should. So left back is a is a concern for me. Did we see enough from from Danny Rose on on Tuesday night to think that we can we can get a season out of him? We said at the time that was a game that was played at a low tempo. With Danny Rose, we saw a player who would be better than Messina. The question is for how long and how much of the season can he be a first choice? By the way, Mike, you you you, you you're a very clever man sometimes, aren't you? You say we can all be positive, but then you bring out the negatives in there. <laughs> You know, I don't know if it was well, the if it was the sunshine or the San Miguel that you you you're consuming over there, but you know, it was a it was a positive there are more way, way more positive to take out of that performance than we did against Brighton. I think so, but I, I think we'd be doing our fellow supporters a, a misservice if, if we didn't look at the defence. And, no, no. and and again, Jace, I, I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear your your take on it. I think Sierra Alta is obviously is obviously fantastic. I think they're, they're so much better when the midfield is strong in front of them. But that tells you all you need to know about that about that defence. And I, it just feels to me. I thought and Gaki was good when he came on. I think he he looks busy. He's this sounds wrong, but he, it, there's a touch of the Lloyd Doyleys about him. He's very, very difficult to get past. He's busy, he's bustly. He seems to understand the shape of the attacker and knows where he's going to put it and, and puts himself in between it. So, and I like that. It's just down that, that left flank, I feel, I, feel, I feel nervous about that. And we saw what Manchester City did to Arsenal yesterday. And I know it, we don't, we should, that's not the benchmark, that's not the, the litmus test for Watford, but... I just, I just do have a little nagging doubt about whether they'll be working feverishly over the next couple of days. What have we got now? 48 hours, give or take, before the transfer window closes. Whether they will be looking for, for someone at, at cover at left-back. Yeah, and that seemed to be where they were trying to get in behind us quite a lot, particularly in that first half, I thought, where... And and again, it maybe not just the personnel, but perhaps the way we play as well. 
there seemed to be gaps from whoever was in the, the full back position and who was sort of next one on towards the middle. There was a gap there to exploit sort of time and time again. That is a concern. And also the fact we defend quite narrow, don't we? And and where this where that gap wasn't there on our right hand side, you then had room on the edge of the box and beyond out wide for, for Spurs players to occupy and sort of get overloads, get a couple of players out there and sort of work the ball fairly comfortably into the box. Having said all that, I thought that the guys, the actual personnel at the back coped really well today in terms defensively. The fact that we did only let one goal in, obviously the frustrating one that we let in. Other than that, Backman made a couple of good saves, but one of those was a deflected set piece, wasn't it? And to be fair, he he wasn't really tested other than that because the guys I think did did such a good good job defensively. We just got to sort of caveat that with the fact that we've got to be on it all the time. I think we've we've if if that's the personnel we're going to go with, if that if that's the way we're going to play, we need to be sharp. And it's going to be as I said before, it's going to be hard work and it's going to be tiring for the guys. And there'll be games where they are dead on their feet at the end, and it's gonna it's gonna cost us. With the back four we had today, and with Ngaki as well, like you say, did well. I think. Apart from the, his first involvement in the game where he got closed down quite quickly by Ali and, and sort of gave the ball away. Other than that, he was pretty solid as well. So it, it bodes well, I think. It bodes well. But if they want to bring in another left back, then um, all the better. Let me end on a positive, John, uh, with one sentence. We don't look out of place in the Premier League. And that was something that I was slightly concerned about. I, I think we definitely look at home in this division. And with a little bit of luck and a fair wind, it could be good fun this year. From the Rookery End, a podcast about life following Watford FC. Sunday saw Watford women's team kick off their new season away at Durham. There were four competitive debuts for the team. It ended 2-1 in defeat, uh, but the girls did come back and get a goal back after being 2-0 down at half-time. However, it was the team's first game back in the FA Women's Championship, the second tier of the women's game here in England after they won promotion last season just like the men's team. To find out more about the upcoming season, I spoke to Amber Wildgust, the newly appointed general manager for Watford Women, and after winning promotion last season, I started by asking her about the step up in division and what it will be like for a team like Watford. The step is huge. It's absolutely massive. The National League is a really good and competitive league, but the Championship is even more competitive and more exciting and there's loads of teams in there that have been in there for, for a few years and are struggling to get out. Um, you've got the likes of Durham that have been sitting pretty at the top for quite some time, but they just haven't managed to find that extra percent to get promoted. So it's a tough league. It's, it really is. But it's exciting. It's a really good league to come down and watch. All the teams are really competitive. They play some great football, different types of football, and there's some really good, young, promising, promising talent in the league as well along with a mixture of uh, experienced players that are probably coming to the end of their career and don't want to play full-time anymore in the Super League. So they, they come down into the Championship. So there's a real mixture of talent and experience, uh, both across it, uh, individual players and across teams um, and clubs. What will success look like then for you, this for Watford this year? What is it going to be like for, the, for us as fans of the men's team? We'd take 17th right now in the Premier League um, <laughs> just uh, just, just for, at this point at least anyway we haven't seen them play that many games but what would what would a successful season be like for, for Watford women? The obvious answer to that is to not get relegated but I'm not one I'm not a person to, to aim low I don't want to aim low but equally I want to be realistic um, I think we've got a good team I think Clinton and the staff have done well with their recruitment they've recruited well we've got a, bu- um, a good bunch of girls that are experienced in that league and, and I think we'll do well. So success for us this season will be competing and competing well with the teams across the league, both at the top and at the bottom, and starting to form a brand of football that's exciting to watch and being hard to beat. The recruitment we've seen in the transfer window for the, the men's first team has been a mixture of senior players who played at this higher level as well as some young up-and-coming players that they can be developed. Is that a similar kind of intake that the women's team have had? We were quite fortunate at Watford that when obviously the team was relegated into the National League, a lot of players stayed because they liked the club, they liked the setup, and they wanted to get the club back into the championship. 
So we already had a quite a lot of players that had that experience. The signings that um, we've made this summer, again, are good signings, good experience signings. Obviously, you've got Amber Stobbs, who's got quite a pedigree, shall we say. She was obviously Reading back in the day, West Ham, Crystal Palace, Charlton, when they finished third a few years ago. So we have recruited some really experienced players of the league that know it really well. Same with like Jenna Legg. But then also we've recruited some like exciting, promising talent and also given opportunities to some of our development players and brought them up into the first team. I know it doesn't answer your question what signings have we brought in, but we're quite fortunate that we are developing some good players in our development team that we've given the opportunity to. That sounds very a very Watfordy approach. <laughs> You sort of had the, you said there how the, the women had sort of stuck around because of the facilities Watford have. You know, we've spoken with Helen Ward before, and there was a great picture on social media this week with uh, Adika and, and Helen relaxing and chatting with Troy Deeney at the training ground. You know, what, what is it that's you know the facilities that we've seen before? Is, is that going to continue? Uh, and and is that a major difference for the Watford team compared to the rest of the FA Women's Championship? Yeah, I think obviously we're really fortunate to train at the men's training ground. We get access to the the first team gym, we get access to all the pitches, which is massive. And the medical team have been really supportive of us over the last couple of weeks, um, getting us ready for the start of the season. So yeah, the facilities are massive, but with having facilities and access to the club and the men's first team and links with the academy, it's not just about the facilities, it's about the feel that you get as players and staff and you feel part of it. You feel like you're at Watford. You feel part of the family. And that's the biggest thing around facilities is how it makes you feel and how it makes you feel valued. And we're really, really fortunate at Watford that the players do feel valued and they feel part of the club and they don't just feel like they're a women's team that trains somewhere else off-site. They're not allowed in the training ground. We're really fortunate that we are part of the training ground and we are Watford. What's the life schedule, let's say, for, for training and then the number of teams? They don't all train every day, do they? No, so a lot. obviously we're part-time and a lot of the players have full-time jobs. The majority of them work Monday to Friday, 9 till 5, in a variety of different roles. So then they train with us Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the evenings. Um, it's quite late, but obviously you know what the M25 is like. <laughs> players get over to the training ground. So yeah, we train 7 till 10. So 7 till 8, we'll normally do analysis or gym and then they're on the pitch for two hours. Three training sessions, it's it's not as much as what the other teams are doing at the moment, but it's a start and we've just been promoted into the championship. And I think Clint and Nikki and the team are putting together a really good schedule that, yes, even though we are training three nights a week, it will be of quality and it will be enough and it will prepare the players enough to go and get hopefully three points at the weekend. So, yeah, really happy with the facilities and what we've got going on at training. You, this, this for you, this is if you're fairly new to the job, let's say, but it's a new chapter for your career. You were yeah. general, general manager at Aston Villa. Now, that, that's a phrase that lots of football fans, or you try and again, try and put it into the men's team. What, what does that role mean? What is your role as general manager? You're a, a mixture, I suspect, of many roles in the men's team. It's quite difficult to explain the role because no one ever really knows what I do until I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the best way for me to describe it. Jack of all trades, master of none is another way I like to describe it too. The best way for me to describe it is Clinton deals with everything on the pitch and then I deal with everything off the pitch. So whether that's signing, stadiums, facilities, um, recruiting staff, recruiting players, making sure we have the right medical equipment, making sure the players are getting paid on time, sponsorships, supporting the commercial team with that, kind of just everything really. But then I... Obviously, you get a lot of support from the commercial team at the stadium, from the marketing team, from finance. So I'd say I'm like the gatekeeper into the women's team is probably another way that you could describe it. You know, this is not the first time you've you've done this. You were you successfully made Aston Villa a, a, a team in the in the Super League. You know, wh- why why move to Watford? Why make that step? Technically, a, a step down. I moved to Watford because. I re- like I really enjoyed my time at Villa and I really enjoyed the challenge it, g- it gave me. Um, when I first started at Villa, they were in a very, very similar position to where Watford are now. Um, we were second from bottom in what was WSL2 then. And we were training two nights a week at the men's training ground. And then we 
we built it up training three nights a week and then training three nights a week with options to train in the afternoon and then obviously eventually we made it full time in the Super League so that challenge and that progression and building foundations and bringing good people in that are good at their job to then go into the Super League was really exciting and I want to do it again basically I want to do it again but I want to do it even better and Watford seemed like a really really good fit a really good club that are on board proactive and are investing in the women's game obviously they hosted the Conti Cup well Watford hosted the Conti Cup at the end of last season I thought oh, okay and then obviously I saw the advert and yeah it was definitely a club that I wanted to work for and like I said I just want to be able to do that all again but even better uh, and the first few games of the season our home games of the season are going to be at Vicarage Road what's that going to mean again for this the, the next few steps of, of Watford women again like I think it's a massive statement of intent it shows that the club are invested in the women's team it shows that they're willing to support it's also a massive opportunity to have fans back like I've missed them so much so yeah it'll be good hopefully as well there'll be some men's season ticket holders that because the men aren't at home that weekend, they'll come down and watch the women's team and fall in love with us as well. And it'll bit hopefully build a little bit of momentum with us having three games at Vicarage Road, build up a fan base, and then we can then take everyone over to Kings Langley, which is a great little ground as well, um, quite quirky. And obviously you can, it's like your classic non-league ground, beer and burger. So I like that we've got that mixture as well. Of you've got the Vicar- Vicarage Road and you've also got Kings Langley. Um, so, yeah, the first three games at Vicarage Road are going to be massive. So we need as many people down there as we can to fill it it's a great ground. The girls are really looking forward to playing there and they're really, really looking forward to finally playing in front of fans and in this league as well. Tickets for Watford ladies can be bought from the main Watford website, season ticket holders. For the men's team, get a discount on both season tickets and match day tickets for the women's team. And, of course, the first game is at Vicarage Road next Saturday, the 4th of September, against Liverpool. And you know how we like to play Liverpool at Vicarage Road. Do make sure you also follow the team on social medias to find out more about their journey this season by looking at their Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Just search Watford FC Women. And of course, we hope to do a lot more with the women on From the Weekend this season. Part of the Athletic Podcast Network. This is From the Rookery End. We've uh, had uh, one goodbye this week, Mike, uh, and we are expecting an emotional second one from what's been going around for the last couple of days. Uh, it is the end of the transfer window. Will Hughes finally got his move away after the huge saga documented extensively by Adam on The Athletic. But there's this rumour going around uh, about Troy potentially leaving the club. Nothing really firm coming through quite yet, as we record on Sunday afternoon. But first of all, Will going, what do you see with, with that? It, it, it feels a relief in some ways. Uh, but it, it was the thing that was always going to be, be coming. A relief that it's over, absolutely, but also you know, an, an overriding sense of disappointment in it because the situation was, if we're to believe everything we're told and there's no reason why we shouldn't, Watford didn't want to sell Will Hughes and Will Hughes didn't want to leave Watford. And for it to end in a situation where he's departed Vicarage Road, probably, and this is no disrespect to Crystal Palace, I, and you know, believe me, any chance to disrespect Crystal Palace, I will take. But this is <laughs> no disrespect. Lies. This is no disrespect to Crystal Palace. That wasn't the move he was after. And what effectively we've done is we've seen a player that didn't want to leave, that we didn't want to leave, go to a, let's you know again, no disrespect to Crystal Palace, a relegation rival. We've strengthened a relegation rival, and I'd like to think that there'll be lessons learned on both sides of the defence. I, th- I think I said it. A couple of weeks ago, maybe uh, six weeks ago now, when this whole saga started, I think both sides of the both parties were unlucky because Scott explained to us at the end of last season, at the start of the summer, that Watford were going to have to cut their cloth accordingly and were going to take a very different approach to the way they dished out contracts and contract renewals. And it just so happened that Will Hughes, who, in fairness to Will Hughes and his agent, have seen every virtually everyone at Watford turn up with one year left on their contract in some cases more turn up knock on the knock on the uh, director's door and leave with a presumably improved contract 
Well, we'll, we'll speak to Adam on Thursday's podcast to find out the yeah the story behind it. But but do either follow Adam on 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 Twitter at Adam Leventhal. Uh, but also you know if you want to follow the more depth and find out about these stories more, you can subscribe to the Athletic by going to theathletic.com forward slash Rookery end, uh, and it costs you three ninety nine a month, which is about a third off the normal price. You, you're right, Mike. I, it's a thing you keep saying. This is what I really want to find out from Adam. The player didn't want to leave. We know that, of course, there's the Watford, there's the agent, and there's Will. And we know what Will said, but I don't know. There, there were, I, yeah, basically, I'm waiting for Adam to tell us the full story behind what was going on, and he speaks to these people. The other one, Jason, who looks like he's going to be on his way out. Uh, the, uh, the the Jungle Drums say he's heading home uh, to Birmingham City. Troy Deeney, this was always going to be a difficult one, no matter if he left after a terrible performance, after winning a, a trophy, or now, which which the last season has been, a, a long goodbye in, in many senses. He, he doesn't want to stick around at, at Watford, it seems, with little opportunity for him to be a, a starting player. There's too many ahead of him. How are you feeling about the, the possibility of a, a tweet coming up with a thanks, Troy, uh, and good luck in the future? Well, that's exactly what it needs to be, doesn't it, in terms of the way he leaves. It needs to be a thank you, a good luck for the future. And you, you kind of contrast the the two exits, the, the, the Will Hughes one that we've been talking about, where what's the motivation been behind that for both player and club, where with this one with Troy, it seems to be clear that it's... Troy wants to play football and we know yeah he's he's getting on a bit and he's like you say he's not high up in the pecking order he knows he's not going to get the game time that he wants and if he's got the opportunity to move on and and play at a lower level then I think that's that's fantastic it, it's great to see a player of his ability because he still has ability you don't play in the in in the premier league for for so long if you haven't got that that talent so for him to get that opportunity to to continue to show what he can do we know what sort of player he is he he enjoys playing he plays with his heart on his sleeve and you know that wherever he'll go he'll give everything that he's got and this potential opportunity to go to what it seems his his sort of home club, the club he supports uh, in Birmingham City, is it, fantastic for him. I know the the Birmingham fans on social media are getting quite excited about the the prospect as well. Would be interesting to see how he does perform because he was in the championship last season and whilst didn't get he didn't get that much for looking, did he? Once uh, sort of Gel Pedro was in the side and obviously he had um, his injury problems as well, but there was a period where. He was quite integral to the team. Sort of when Cisco first came in, there were a couple of games where um, he was important. He's obviously his penalties were important to us as well last season. Yeah, what sort of role he'd play at Birmingham, I don't know, but it's it'll be. We need to give him a good send off and sort of thank him for for everything that he's done. Whilst his, his time at Watford clearly is coming to an end, we we should remember everything that he's done. And it's and it's not been an easy journey, has it for him? It's not been an easy no, journey. No. Mike, you know, I I think I was trying to figure out how many times we've interviewed him. I think it's at least five times we've sat down with him. You know, not that I, I'm his friend, not that I know him, but you know, when we we've seen the whites of his eyes in front of us, you know, Jason's talked about the footballing things we'll miss. And we need to say goodbye. What is it? What is the real things we're going to miss about Troy if he does happen to leave, or even if it is this week when he does end up leaving? I was actually quite surprised with how emotional I felt when when it became clear that they. It felt like they were more than just rumours. Obviously, and then obviously Watford and Troy put that that joint statement out, which says to us that it's pretty much going to happen. He wasn't in the squad for, for Tottenham, and it feels like there's only one one ending here, doesn't it? And you know, for all the time, effectively, we've been doing from the rookery end, Troy Deeney has been at the forefront, hasn't he? He's been an absolutely vital part of Watford. He's been, for better or worse, sometimes he's been the the people that everyone, you know, opposition fans always know. You hear the name Watford and they think Troy Deeney. And I, I just think he's been so integral on and off the pitch. And I, I get the fact that people, he, his abrasive nature sometimes rubs people up the wrong way. But what you cannot deny, and I think what our experience has taught us, and certainly my personal experience has, has taught me in, in terms of my interactions with Troy, is he has lived and breathed Watford Football Club for the entirety of his, his career. 
and he's understood the importance of him. He's understood the importance of, you know, he was very quickly elevated to the role as a, as a talisman, wasn't he? And he and he got that, and he recognised how important that was. And he was he's always been generous with his time in terms of us. But when you watch him uh, on social media, if you look at him giving autographs, posing for photos. Um, social media is awash with anecdotes of, of when he's got in touch with people who have been struggling. And, and we talk about being proud of, of Watford as a football club, but the reality is the football club is, is the people that are involved in it and the people that are at the, the forefront of it. And Troy has been at the forefront of Watford for a long, long time now, and you cannot separate him from the success that Watford have had. You cannot, you cannot separate him from the, the personality that Watford have. You cannot separate him from what Watford do in the community. He's as big a part of that as, as anyone else. He gives up his time generously and freely, and he's always nothing but committed on the pitch, which is supporters, we can't ask for, for anything more than that. He's been so important to, to us as a football club, I think it's it's almost impossible to articulate. You know, I have personally experience of, you know, he knows how much Arlo loves Watford, he's been in touch with with, with messages for, for Arlo, and, and we're by no means the only one that he's done, done that for. He does it for loads and loads of people, and for me, he represents Watford in in an exemplary fashion. I'm, I'm just proud that he's worn the, the number nine for, for Watford so long. I'm proud of what he's, what he's delivered for Watford and I'm proud that he's been a, a, a Watford player. What He's been on a hell of a journey. We've been there with him and I, I wouldn't have it any other way. And it'll be sad when he goes. You know, we've talked to the kids about it and I, you know, I literally had to wait, choose my moment to tell them that Troy might be leaving <laughs> because I, I know what, what he means to them. And I, the, the most important thing about that is, I know he gets that. He knows what he means to, to people, the people of Watford. He knows what he means to us as supporters. He knows that he's rubbed people up the wrong way as well. He, he gets that. He knows who he is, but he knows his role and he knows what he's done. And I think we owe it to him to show him that. It strikes me that the, the, the statement from Watford means they will make sure that if he does leave, that, that looks very likely it's done in the, in the best possible way. Yeah, I don't mind admitting it. I think I'll, I'll be pretty emotional. We knew this day was coming. We knew this day was coming. And uh, uh, Jason would spoke very pragmatically, which is, is correct. We need, to, we need to do the right thing for our, for our team, for the club. I'm finding it harder than I, than I thought I might. You're absolutely right, Mike. And we'll, we'll try and do something with the podcast to sort of try and reflect it when if it does happen this week or when it does finally happen. My big worry for Troy is, does he have to write a final chapter and rush it to print for his new book that's coming out in a few weeks' time? Because that, that, that moment where he, the last chapter where he puts on his Birmingham City shirt could be a great ending to a book. Uh, we'll be back, of course, as already mentioned, on Thursday uh, with Adam to, to really just sit back and, and, and look back at this, this transfer window and, and everything that's been going on and everyone he's been speaking to. Remember, that's out on a Thursday morning, these podcasts where we, we reflect on the weekend's action to come out on a Monday morning. Yeah, we're going to be here all season from the Rookerend. So do do follow us uh, on your podcasting app, but also, of course, on social media at What for Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, and thank you, Michael. Gracias. <laughs> it was a loss, but it was a positive loss. That sounds weird. But come on, you all. The Athletic. <laughs>